Good morning. Yeah. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. In fact, guys, um, I've been getting a lot of lower views because the fact that I'm unable to post to my uh, page, Calvary Chapel Inland. Um, so I encourage you to share these uh, posts. It's written right there on the top to also to share this on your wall so that others can see it too. So uh, please do that. Um, that way this message can go out. I'd appreciate that. It's not very difficult. It doesn't take a whole lot of work either to do so. Um, if it's because you're embarrassed, then I'm sorry. If it's because... Uh, you don't want to offend someone, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're gonna offend someone no matter what. I mean, we should be uh, bold about our faith and sharing it, but I get it that we don't want to offend people <clears throat> with some of our posts. But guys, I'm telling you, we're living in the day and age where we're gonna see more offenses coming against the church more than ever before. And so you better either get ready now or you're gonna really jeopardize your very life later on so just just saying think about these things okay we are in chapter 8 of hebrews let's pray gracious father we thank you lord for your precious word and how how clear your word is lord on truth and and how we need to really read it study it observe it interpret it and then apply it to our lives lord just a simple application of receiving your word lord and believing what it says father not trying to read into it and, and, and being subjective about it, Lord, but just objectively receiving the word of God, Lord. May you help us to have understanding through the Holy Spirit, Lord. May he open our eyes and our hearts to you, Lord, that we would see this truth, Father. And thank you that the writers are writing so simply, Father, that, that if we truly just take our time in reading it, that it's not very difficult to understand in most places, Father. And so, Lord, would you minister to us now and encourage us, Lord, that we have such a high priest in Jesus Christ who has come and given us a whole different way of salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so oftentimes when you're reading the New Testament, if you read the whole book, you'll find why they're writing the letter. Uh, John will say things, I write these things to you, boom, and then he tells you why he wrote them. Here we see in Hebrews chapter 8, the exact reason why the author is writing to us. And it's very clear, and it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything we do is about Jesus. Guys, we need to take our minds off of ourself, and we need to start thinking about Jesus and what he would do. You know, it gets tiresome to deal with people in the church that aren't thinking about Jesus and others more highly than they think about themselves. It's tiresome. The church needs to wake up and stop being so self-centered and selfish. Now, hey, I get it. The disciples were the same way. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Why can't I have this? How come he gets to do that? Why can't I do it? And, and all of this garbage that just goes on within the church. Guys, we need to stop that and start thinking more clearly and more biblically and start living the Christian life that we're professing to have uh, very clearly. Um, please, please, please think about these things. So he writes these things. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. So how much clearer do we need it? This is the point of why I'm writing these things, why I'm saying what I'm writing to you that are listening to me. And he makes these points. We have such a high priest. Who's this high priest that he's talking about? He's been talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ being a high priest. Though we saw that he wasn't of the Levitical tribe. He was of the tribe of Judah and not the Levites. And though he really had no lineage connecting him to the high priest. Yet 
the writer here is saying he is the high priest. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Melchizedek. He is the greatest thing that has ever happened to mankind. And that is Jesus and Jesus alone. Not Joseph Smith, who is of the Mormon church and came up with new tablets and a new other gospel of Jesus Christ. Not Joseph, not uh, Russifert, who is of the Jehovah Witnesses, you know, and took the Bible and said, there's some errors here. Let me correct them for you. No, it is Jesus and Jesus alone that saves us. The high priest said, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Where is he seated? In heaven, next to God, the majesties. That is the throne room of God himself. There is the Father, the Son is seated at his right hand. All three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, seated there in heavens. Now, he's talking about what? The, he's talking about after the resurrection, right? He's not walking with us any longer. This is after he resurrected from the dead, and now he ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. What he's saying here. Verse 2, he goes on to describe him. A minister of the sanctuary, uh, or the holy of holies is the literal word, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. So there's a true tabernacle. He's not talking about the temporary one that Moses erected, the one that Solomon built, the one that um, Herod uh, beautified there during the time of Christ. He's talking about a heavenly tabernacle that God has for us that is in the heavenly places. And in fact, he, he is going to reference Moses who, who was instructed to build the tabernacle exactly as God instructed him because it was to be a mere image of what God built in heaven. So there's a tabernacle in heaven that God has built that Jesus is the priest and the head over in this spiritual tabernacle that is in heaven, which the Lord erected, not man. Man cannot receive the glory. It is God alone. For every high priest, now he's talking about earthly priest, is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so as a priest here on earth in the temple, you were to offer up the sacrifices that people gave. You were to get the offerings and collect from the treasury boxes that were within the temple and give it to the Levitical tribe. That was your responsibility. You were to give gifts to men, pray for them, heal them, uh, if God so wanted to use you in that gift of healing. This is what men did at that time, though they were flawed because earthly priests are not perfect, right? There's only a few. They can't get to everybody, first of all. And I know everybody's important. Everybody demands an, an audience as quickly as possible because it's all about us, you know, and not everyone else. And so why ain't I getting first in line here? Why ain't I getting what I want and so forth? Uh, unfortunately, you live in a human system that's flawed and sinful, and you're not going to get what you want immediately. It just doesn't happen that way. So these men, these priests, are offering up and appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, and that's Jesus, capital O, also have something to offer. And boy, did Jesus have something to offer. We can go down the list. Talk all that Jesus has to offer. And just eternal security, right? Jesus is the author of salvation. I posted a question last night because somebody posted a comment about a relative of ours being in heaven and that I will see that relative in heaven. And I, I hear that often, especially as a pastor, I'll go to funerals and <clears throat> usually it is the Christian believer who asks me to be the officiator over the funeral and I'll ask them, was the person saved? And they'll say, no, they never went to church, they didn't believe in Jesus Christ and so forth. So immediately I know what I'm entering into. I'm entering into an area where people that are there who love this person even though they're not Christian and they don't believe in Jesus Christ, yet they'll clearly state and make that profession that we'll see you in heaven. You're in a better place. Uh, and now, is that true? And because of that, I ask the question, is that true? Everybody just gets a free pass and they all get to go to heaven? No. And the answer to that is no. Uh, it's just interesting how people didn't want to answer that question because it, it, it is going to bring up a lot of interesting feelings, you know, that not everyone gets to go to heaven. Broad is the way to destruction. Mm -hmm. Narrow is the way to eternal life, the Bible says. Few enter in. 
few enter into heaven. You know, uh, Nicodemus said you, uh, to Jesus, you know, how can a man uh, enter into heaven? He had some questions and Jesus said, you have to be born again in order to enter into heaven. So you have to be a born again believer in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. See, now those are all clear scriptures, but yet Christians insist on thinking that everyone gets to go to heaven. And they don't make that clear. It is Jesus alone who's the author of salvation. Amen. And it is according to his way that we get to go to heaven. No other way. I don't care who you are. I don't care how high you are in a church or political arena. The Bible is clear and it speaks above anyone else because it's God's living word. And it is clear that there is only one way and it's through Jesus Christ. Any other way is not the right way. And if there was... If everybody gets to go to heaven, then let me ask you this simple question. Why did Jesus come and die on the cross for the sins of mankind? Why? If everyone just gets to go to heaven, there would be no reason for him to die. Well, so that everyone could go to heaven. No, yes, everyone could. But will they? No, because they won't surrender their lives to Jesus. Now, let's move on. That's just a sore subject for me right now. <clears throat> so... Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Jesus, also having something to offer, for he, for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, because he was not a part of the Levitical tribe. Uh, his father, Judah, the son of Jacob, was not Levite, the son of Jacob. So he came through a different line, and then it was the line of Judah that the Messiah would come through. David was in that sign. Mary was in that line. Joseph was in that line of Judah. And so Jesus was in that line. So if he was on earth, he wouldn't be a priest. But there would be priests through the line of Levi who would offer up offerings according to the law. That is the law of God <clears throat> in the Old Testament from, from, let me see, Leviticus all the way to Deuteronomy, you have the whole law and how God ran the tabernacle and the laws of God and how he functioned in the government, the political area of that law, how it all functioned. Now, he goes on and says, who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Now, what is the copy and shadow? Well, what I said earlier, God has built a tabernacle in heaven by his hands, not man's. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. That, that, the priests here on earth during the time of this writer, as the temple was still there, they were serving within the temple, but they were serving a spiritual copy that was in heaven, a shadow of something that was to come in the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make it all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Now, why? Because God wanted it to be a replica of what was in heaven. So make sure that you do exactly what I say, Moses. And Moses did because Moses loved God, because Moses believed in God. Moses trusted God and Moses was obedient to the word of God. He didn't come up with his own system, you know, like we do today. Here's some applications. Just do what God says. Uh, people wear these shirts. Obey. They wear these shirts. Obey. And I know them because I see them and I love them to death. But are they obeying? No. They're not. They're disobedient. They ought to wear... I, I'd be glad to wear a shirt. Disobedient. Because no, most cases, I want to do my own thing. We all do. That's our nature. The flesh that's in us. Romans chapter 6, 7 and 8. Very clear. That is the nature that we have. Disobedient. Not of this world? Really. I'd, I'd probably wear one that says, I'm of this world more than not of this world. Because when you start wearing those things, you're claiming something that you are not. And if you're wearing those, you better be obedient in every aspect and in every way. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it sounds like you're, you, you're really you know, getting down. Look, guys, none of us are righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Paul, even the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15 said, I'm the chief of sinners. Mm -hmm. I'm the foremost. That is, before anyone else, I'm the worst. Paul would never wear a shirt on there saying, I'm a glorified saint. You know, No, he'd say, I'm a sinner. He'd have the chief sinner right here on his shirt, right? Now, that doesn't mean we walk around, you know, all moping and, and powerless. no. Because we know that, we know we need Christ, and it's Christ in us, the hope and glory 
that gets us to do what we do. So he has prepared works for us that we should walk in them. And so we walk in them. And like Moses was instructed, build it as I said, Moses. And Moses did. He did. He built it exactly as the Lord had instructed him. So it was a replica of the heavenly thing that was in heaven. But now, verse 6, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better co covenant, which was established on better promises. Now, he's still talking about Jesus, that he's not an earthly priest. He's a heavenly priest, and he's a heavenly priest of something uh, more excellent in ministry than the earthly tabernacle and priesthood and all the government aspect of it. Uh, a better covenant that, was, that has been established with a better promises because it's the promises of God's grace through his son Jesus Christ. So what is this new covenant? This better covenant? Look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Now, what first covenant is he talking about? The law, yeah. right? The law, the tabernacle, follow the law. Keep the Ten Commandments. Offer up the sacrifices, you know? If, you're, if you have a, a boil, go in. Show yourself to a priest. You're unclean. Wait seven days. Offer up a sacrifice. All of these rituals had to be fulfilled. If that was perfect and faultless, there would be no need for anything else. But it wasn't, is it? We have the law, and yet we break it. We break it every single day. We break the law in the state of California every day. We break the traffic laws every day. As, as soon as, you know, the law says you're to go 65 miles an hour on the freeway. As soon as you go 65.5, you broke the law. As soon as you go 67 miles, you broke the law. As soon as you go 70, some of us 120, uh, you know, you've broken the law. You've broken the law. So the law isn't working, and that's his point here. <clears throat> in Hebrews, that the law is flawed because it's not flawless. As it says here, the first covenant had been faultless because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So because the law was faultless, God had a plan. And that plan was to make a new covenant. And the new covenant is the work of Jesus Christ alone on the cross. What he did on the cross and all our sins put upon him and he paid the penalty of our sins, the guilt. He took it all when he died on that cross for us. And so there is no longer any penalty for sin today. There is no penalty for sin today. If we, if we appropriate, we, we take Christ into our hearts and live in obedience to him. Now when I say live into obedience to him, what I'm saying is we're saved by grace through faith. But the evidence of our salvation is that the fruit is works. There will be fruit of works, of righteousness, of joy, of peace, of all these things that are showing forth. Now, if you think that it's your works that save you, then you're still under the law. No, the works are just evidence of your salvation. <clears throat> so, he's going to show them a greater covenant, a better covenant. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them saying the Lord. Now he's talking, going back to Egypt and how Moses pulled them out of the wilderness, um, pulled them into the wilderness and God there in Sinai brought down the 10 commandments, uh, established the blueprints for the new t tabernacle, uh, the priesthood, set everything in order. He says, when I did all of this, it's going to be better than that. Much, much better than that because they could not keep it. So I disregarded everything they did, he said. Disregarded it all. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. So this is the covenant, guys. Very simple. This is it. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's not religion. That's relationship. When you look at two kings, King Saul and King David, <clears throat> David was not king at the time of Saul, but Saul was king. When you look at those two men, Saul did what was right in his own eyes. He was not obedient to God. He knew God. He knew Israel. He knew the God of Israel, but he was not obedient to God. 
and God ended up judging him. He even went to a witch. He went to horoscoping. He went to reading the, the um, fortune cookies to find out what he wants to do in life. And then when God gave him a commandment, he did the opposite of what God said because he felt it, he knew better. Uh, that's a fleshly life. That is a life without God. Uh, that is a life trying to live under the law, doing his own thing. Then you look at David. I think it's uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, 16. talks about David doing everything that was right except for one thing. He sinned with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah. But other than that, he was obedient to the Lord. And the Lord counted that obedience as righteousness to David. David had a heart for God. You see, what he's saying here is that God will put his law, his truth, his righteousness in our hearts. It will be a part of us. <clears throat> it's what we would call conviction. When you do something wrong, you get convicted. Oh, why did I do that? I need to make that right. And so then you go and you make it right because the law's in your heart. You don't have to read it somewhere. No one has to tell you it's in you already. That's about relationship. When you hurt your mama, when you hurt your daddy, you go make it right because it's in your heart. Now we can harden our hearts to that and ignore it. We can ignore conviction. We get convicted over things. I'll just use a silly example. But you could be walking in a church and you see trash on the ground. You look down and you go, oh, I'm not going to pick that up. And you just keep walking. And you're convicted because you're like, I should have picked that up. You know, but it's just something simple. It's no big deal. Someone else will get it. Yeah, and it's true. They will. But the conviction's there, right? That conviction's there. And the Lord was telling you to pick it up. Even something as simple as that. And then the next time you, you, you come along, you see it again. You're like, oh, I should pick it up. But then you keep walking. And what happens is, is that you're hardening your heart. So the next time you, you don't even notice it. And the next time you walk right by it and you just totally oblivious to it, you don't even see it anymore. And yet it's there all the time. So we can harden our hearts to that. We wanna keep our hearts open to the law, the conviction there so that when God's law is being applied that we can be obedient to it. Not for salvation, not for salvation. <clears throat> You see someone in the grocery line and you're paying for your food. They're walking out and they're putting their purse away and all of a sudden a $10 bill drops on the ground. And right away you have something happening in your mind. Oh, do I pick it up and give it to them? Or do I put my foot over it and wait till they're gone and then keep it? You know, do you do that? And that's the conviction. Which one of those do I do? And a lot of people just say, oh man, you dropped your $10 bills. Others will wait. I've seen some Facebook ones where guys would drop their wallets. They're just walking by and they're filming the whole thing. They'll drop their wallet and walk by and then someone will pick it up and start looking at it and then walking away. And the guy turns around, hey, hey I dropped my wallet. That's my wallet. He goes, oh yeah, I was gonna give it back to you. Here, here, here. You know, and, and so they catch people really, you know, in that lie, but there's no conviction there. That's the difference. God has written it in our hearts, the law in our minds. He's writing them in our hearts. This is all about relationship. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Because we love God, we keep his commandments. Because we love God. What is the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. What is the second one? And we're all challenged with this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. I'm tired of the church not loving each other. It gets tiresome when sisters and brothers don't like someone in the church. And you can tell, guys. Come on. You can tell when you rub the wrong way because of someone. You, you avoid them, you don't talk about them, or when you do, you kind of say some these little innuendos, stop it. That's not love. That's not the love of God in your heart. The love of God should be in our heart. That relationship with God should be in our heart. We should be convicted when we do that. Yeah, but you don't know, they don't deserve it. Oh, none of us deserve it, guys. None of us deserve it. This is what I, I, I have taught Randy. You know, it's taken me a long time, not that he's stubborn, but he's watched me, and one of the things that he's learned is to love people even though sometimes they seem to be unlovable. You know? And he'll say that to me once in a while. Hey, we just have to love them, just as Pastor taught us. We just have to love them. You know? And it's true, you have to love them. You have to love them. 
It's the love of God that's been shed abroad in your hearts. And if you're not loving your neighbor, you're breaking the commandment. And Jesus said, if you fulfill these two commandments, you fulfill the whole law. So if you're not fulfilling that, you've broken the law. But we're not to live by the law. And so we're going to fail. We're not going to love God with all, this, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're not going to love our neighbors. But we're going to get convicted by it because God's in our heart. And that relationship, he will not allow us through the Holy Spirit to sense that we need to correct that. And we need to love one another, help one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another. That's how ministry is. I think you see it more in smaller churches than bigger churches. Bigger churches, you have people waiting in line to get involved. <clears throat> so you can have a ministry and it's filled with maybe 10, 20 people and they're doing the work of that ministry and don't need help from outside of that. You go to a smaller church and someone wants to do something and they're trying the best they can, being one person, but it really needs 10 people, and people watch and wait. Oh, but it didn't work out, it didn't do this, and that, and that. You know what, stop complaining, you should have helped. And in smaller churches, we get the opportunity to participate and help. Instead of being a complainer, be a mover and start helping so that things are successful. But, the, but stop thinking of yourself. But we fail, don't we? All of us fail. But he has written it in our hearts, he says, and they're my people. They shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now, what is he saying there? Really, we don't need anyone teaching us. We're going to know the truth. Nobody led me to the Lord. I heard the word of God and the yes. Lord convicted my heart and he dragged me to himself and I confessed him as my Lord and Savior. It wasn't a man that came to me and said, Reuben, you need to know Jesus Christ and this is why. No, it was just the word of God and him and me and I was convicted. And what God is saying here, it's going to be me who draws men to myself. I will drag them to me. I will save them because it's not the law anymore. And it's not a priest anymore. It is my spirit that will teach them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Now this is big, guys. This is what God is saying to the children of Israel and to us today. We serve a merciful God, a loving God. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and to their lawlessness, their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now the word obsolete is not a good word there. <clears throat> because then we think, oh, we don't have to follow the law anymore. No, the word obsolete means it's been, it's been uh, changed. It's no longer needed in, in the sense of salvation. That's what the word means, nullified, in, in a sense. Not obsolete, totally different. But it's nullified because of a new work. <clears throat> but yet the principles and the truth of the law is still there. Now, what is become obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. And so our salvation through the law is vanishing. There is no salvation through the law. Salvation is only through the new covenant, through Jesus Christ alone. So, does everyone get a free pass to heaven? No. Only those who know Jesus Christ personally. Only those who have God in their hearts and who are convicted of righteousness that are His and know that they're His. Um, the only way I can explain it to you guys is that God comes into you and all you can do is think about God. You wake up in the morning thinking about God, you go to sleep thinking about God, you wanna read his word, you wanna pray, you wanna to go to church, you wanna do the right things. That's all that you wanna do. God is becoming the center point of your life. Now that process is slow with some, I get that. And not everyone is immediately there, but ultimately that's the goal, is that we all begin to put Christ in the center of our lives, amen? amen. This is a great chapter. This is exactly why this author wrote this. For us to understand, it's about Jesus and being obedient to him as he comes and dwells within us. Not laws, not judging one another, but loving and caring about one another. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, I can try to change people till I'm blue in the face, and it never works, Lord. I just pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, would be the catalyst that you use, Father, to change men's hearts, Lord. To see, Lord God, our own self-righteousness, Lord, our own sinfulness, Lord. Help us to be like Christ, Lord. Help us to love as he loved us, Lord.
And Lord, I pray that if you're not in our hearts, Lord, please come into our hearts. Please, please reveal yourself to us deeply within us. Let us not be like Saul. Let us not be like Judas Iscariot. Let us not be like those who <clears throat> divided the church during Paul's time, those who talked bad about the body of Christ, Lord. Let us be those, Lord, who are born-again believers, new creatures in Christ Jesus, Lord. That the old life has passed away and everything is new now. And we have this desire to be new, to walk in newness of life under this new covenant, Lord. Please, Lord, help us. We beg you, Lord, to not forsake us, Lord God. But change us, Lord, from the inside out, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. I pray the Holy Spirit has ministered to you. Um, if I've upset you, I apologize. That's not my intent. Um, but if the Spirit has moved in your life, then listen to the Holy Spirit more than listening to me. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.